We're back again, true believers, for another episode of Comic Watchers. Comic Watchers is brought to you by Comic Watch. Comic Watch is your source for all your comics and media news and reviews written by fans for fans. Don't forget to subscribe and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Spread the word that we're coming for the clickbait sites. It's our time now. I'm your host, Cody, coming to you from Oahu, and once again, down a man. Here's our titular trio. Brian from Arizona. Also, uh, what's my other site? Uh, SuperheroesBookClub.com. But mostly we just know Comic Watch. Hey, guys. It's me, John Jack. You can find me in my group for the love of comic books on Twitter at John Batusi Jack on Facebook at John Jack. One of these days I will list all my pages, of which I have about nine. Uh, <laughs> uh, don't forget we have a Patreon, and if you like what you see, don't forget to subscribe and click the bell to allow notifications. On the news. Awesome. Yeah, so after a bit of a news drought, we've had uh, a pretty good rush of news here in the last week or so, so... Brian, man on the street, take us away. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> all right, so, well, there, I have a couple announcements, not just kind of news. I kind of skimmed the news a little bit. Um, Comic Watch Awards are coming this year, the first annual ever Comic Watch Watchies, I think we're kind of calling it. Um, nominees should be announced sometime in mid-December. Then we'll do a live show on in January to announce it, and then, of course, we'll have an official press release for the winners. Um, also, and Comicology. That, and that is a live show. We will be coming to you live with all of our shenanigans and all of our hijinks. No and drunker filter. than ever. <laughs> actually, no. I agree. I agree. We're going to be probably really drunk. And you're actually going to be able to message us while the show is live. This like, is, so drunk. <laughs> yeah, this is dangerous, you guys. <laughs> like, for us. This is, yeah. For um, you guys, anyway. Yeah, or if you actually <laughs> watch and join us. Uh, so Comicology is releasing the original Wildcats slash Wildstorm series, which I'm really excited about. I think every um, one, like Gen 13, Wildcats, the Wildstorm, all are up to number 12 right now. It's been, if you haven't read it, I strongly recommend reading it. It's cool that they're finally releasing it under the DC label rather than the image. Um, it was one of the ser weird series that was really popular back in the early, mid-90s, uh, and it just kind of was never to be found. So it's nice to see that it's actually being released on uh, streaming services such as Comicology, and I don't know if it's going to be part of their Unlimited yet, but it is currently purchased individual. Uh, does that Blue include, does that uh -huh. include uh, what works? I believe so, yes. Awesome. They awesome. are releasing all of it right now. That's um, fantastic. That's and they're doing news. it little by little, which is nice. You don't have to spend your whole wad right then and there. Right. Uh, Blue Beetle film announced by DC and Warner Brothers. Also, Zantana may be getting a new movie coming out very soon, but who knows? It's DC and it's Warner Brothers. Things I want are announced my Cyborg movie. Huh? We're Cyborg. We're Cyborg. Nightwing. I mean, where's Flash? Like, we've Flash. been promised that. You know, it's, it is what it is. We'll see. Movies are being released. I guess the real news is more movies are being released. If they'll get made, who knows? We'll see. Um, and then, Sat, I don't remember if we talked about this last week, but if not, we're going to go ahead and talk about it this week again. Daredevil was canceled. Um, I'm, I'm heartbroken. I know my fellow colleagues are heartbroken, but I actually have some tea on this. I got some behind-the-scenes information, which I don't actually know if I'm allowed to say. So if I'm not able to, and I'm gone next week, you'll all know why I'm not here. It's um, cool. Like, two people watch this, and neither right, of them seem like... Right, two people watch this. It'll never get back to Marvel or anybody. It's fine. Just remember, <laughs> snitches get stitches. Right. <laughs> so what I've heard is by somebody that knows somebody that may know somebody's cousin in their first real life, all that good stuff. So what's happening is, is that a lot of... All the programming from DC is going to go to, or I'm sorry, Marvel will go to Disney streaming, streaming service plus. However, the certain darker shows like Daredevil, Jessica Jones, so on, um, Disney actually owns a certain part of Hulu and we may end up seeing a lot of those shows may be continued on Hulu. We'll have to wait and see how that plays out. Again, this is rumor and speculation and hearsay. This is not direct headline news, but sources tell us that that may be a 
better, bigger possibility than what we've known in the past. I'm not sure if it'll work with new shows coming forward or if they can just transfer the shows from Netflix over due to different amounts of licensures and contracts and years, that I don't know. Um, but we may actually see a whole new season come in to play. Who knows? We'll wait and see. Keep it here. We have we have some inside sources that hopefully will give us more information as it comes out. Or I just fucked it up for everybody, and we're never getting any information ever again. No, but that's I, all I really have in the news. It's great because you know, at the very least, if nothing else, it gives us a glimmer of hope. Yeah. You know, like even even if it just ends up, you know, they migrate all the previously released material over. At least there's that hope that maybe we can have more Daredevil. Maybe we can have nice things. Um, and, and don't worry, uh, you know who doesn't tell us anything that isn't okay to print. I'm not going right. to say their name. Right. Because they... Because <laughs> I don't want stitches. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But they, uh, they don't tell us anything that isn't acceptable to be released. Right. So we'll see. It's all good rumors and, new, well, kind, kind of news. I, I'm really looking forward to seeing kind of where this changes. I really like when big shakeups happen because you get the possibility of new hope of new things. So we'll see. But that's really it all for the news this week. I mean, that's a pretty big news week. Um, also announced today is a uh, Shang-Chi movie from Marvel is in the works. Um, I fully anticipate Tom Cruise to be in the starring role. Uh, <laughs> however, this can be whitewashed. I'm sure they'll find a way. Uh, also, a new Captain Marvel trailer dropped uh, late last night. Uh, still no word on an Avengers 4 trailer. Oh, boy, there was something else. I don't remember what it was. Nuts. Anyway, it's been a pretty big news week. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's great. I After think a I have some insider news on... <laughs> on the Captain America, I believe, or the Captain, or I'm sorry, Avengers 4, that it may actually debut on Spider-Universe debu- uh, in the movie theater. Uh, uh, the into the into the Spider-Verse? Yes, thank you. And I think that's December 14th. That makes sense. That's yeah. logical, so. And for the trailer, for the new Captain uh, Marvel trailer 2, you can always go to comic-watch.com. So, all right. So, a, a pretty good news week. Mostly positive and happy news. That's that's always nice to see. It's not a whole bunch of uh, most mostly not a whole bunch of cancellations and seeing a bunch of things get the axe. Um, our spotlight book this week. We actually chose two. We chose one Marvel and one DC book to talk on. Uh, the first book we're going to talk about is Dead Man Logan number one. This is a continuation of Old Man Logan, which ended last month at number 50. Uh, of course, last month at the end of number 50, and we covered that in the show, I believe. Uh, Logan knows he's dying. You know, this is our Logan from Mark Miller's future Old Man Logan storyline back in 2006, right? He knows he's dying. Uh, old age, adamantium poisoning, the whole nine yards and is tying up all the loose ends so i mean we kind of saw a little bit of that at the end of old man logan where you know he finally puts down maestro which is you know a future version of the hulk who has traveled back from whatever future he's from and through all the old man logan future and you know old man logan finally deals with him has the opportunity to get access to his time machine and Maestro destroys it in front of him. And Old Man Logan cuts his head off, which was awesome. And then he wanders out into the snow in Canada and passes out. The end of Old Man Logan. Start Dead Man Logan. So with Dead Man Logan, we're seeing a little bit more of this loose end tying up. We're, we see a return to the Jeff Lemire, uh, you know, Old Man Logan was like, how do I stop my timeline from happening? Kill everyone involved. You know, target number one, Mysterio, the, the villain who convinced Logan, tricked Logan with illusions into killing all of the X-Men in his timeline. So, you know, here's old man Logan hunting down Mysterio. He teams up with young man Hawkeye. Uh, and the two of them go on a hunt for, for Mysterio 
Okay, this looks bad. <laughs> okay, this looks bad, right? So, I mean, the two of them, like, the banter between them is fantastic. Uh, and as all of this is kind of playing out, we see Forge take Maestro's time machine and fix it. Go to Last Destination. And all of a sudden, we've got Forge in the wastelands that Old Man Logan came from. Now, nothing has come of that yet. But I imagine big things are coming. I, I anticipate this this is a twelve issue maxi series spanning a year. I was and, I was curious. So did Forge go to a different universe or did he go to the future? Because is old man Logan's actions um, enabling his future to happen in this in six sixteen? That's a great question, and it, we don't have enough information right now to answer that, but I, I also had the same kind of question, right? Like, if you can mm. get there with a time machine, yes, are you going to a place that was always destined to happen no matter what happened? Well, not only, or not necessarily was it always destined to happen, is it happening because old man Logan is tipping the people who are involved off to their fate? Is he? Is it happening because Logan has tipped Miss Sinister, who tipped Mysterio off, that he's the one who puts visions of the X Men and Old Man Logan, or of enemies in Old Man Logan's head? Is he self fulfilling his own prophecy? I I think that I mean that's that's obviously something, or maybe not obviously, but something that we should be thinking about, right? Like Miss Sinister gleans Old Man Logan's memories during the hunt and then reports those back to Mysterio and takes him to Neo Hydra, which is being run by uh, Sin and Crossbones, and basically says, you know, here is a plan to get rid of all the heroes. Here is a way that we can do it, and here are the tools. So, I mean, yeah, like, I, I, either this will end up being a circular narrative, or there's some major, you know, time timeline altering shift coming but anyway you slice it like this is a surprise of a just absolute smash book in the making uh i really enjoyed old man logan like a lot but i came into this with kind of expectations that it might be a bit of a weaker book you know a year to cover a year we know how it's going to end old man logan's going to die um L luckily, my shop. Luckily, my shop got shorted on number one, so I'm probably going to retroactively put this on my poll because <laughs> the last issue was good enough. I think I will actually read this, and I'm not a big X Men fan. This is yeah. This is coming from not a big X Men fan and not a big Wolverine fan. So, <clears throat> speaking of not big Wolverine fans, but big X Men fans, Brian, what were your thoughts on uh, Dead Man Logan number one? Yeah, no, I actually really enjoyed it um, a lot more than I thought I was going to. I think I only read it because you mentioned that it was really good, and I was like, oh, okay, well, I, I got to read it. Um, so the one thing that I loved about it is the glob. Like, I'm not a big glob, or that's not his name, Gloop, right? Gloop, glob, whatever. Glob, glob. Glob. Glob Herman. Uh, yeah, Mr. Herman. <laughs> uh, he I'm, he annoys. He generally kind of annoys me, but there was some sincerity to him. He wanted a date, maybe look a little bit of porn. Who knows what was happening over there? Um, I also really liked Old Man Logan's relationship with uh, Hawkeye. There were some really really funny one-liners. I enjoyed it. I'm in for the whole year. Like, is it bi-monthly, monthly? It'll be a monthly. Okay, so yeah, no, I'm really looking forward to his death, I guess, is one way you could say it. Um, it was good. My only little thing, and this is me trying to look for something bad, would be the art. It's not necessarily my favorite. It's also not my least favorite at all. Um, you know me. I'm picky with my art. I, I like it a certain way, but it's not bad art either. Um, but that's really pretty much what I have to say about that. Um, I, I kind of, it was interesting to see how Neo Hydra is taken over by the daughter, uh, Miss Sinister's involved, which is really funny because I'm not familiar with Miss Sinister at all, or Miss Sinister at all. Um, Darede or <laughs> Daredevil. Um, yeah, that's, that's where we're going to go with that one. 
<laughs> and I'm the sober one. <laughs> <laughs> I should have mentioned, right? So it's written by Ed Brisson. Uh, Ed Brisson has written about the last, I want to say, year or so of Old Man Logan. He's also uh, the mastermind behind Extermination and one of the three main writers on Uncanny X-Men right now. Uh, Ed Brisson has really, in a short amount of time since he first came on my radar, really risen to one of the top writers at Marvel right now, in my opinion. Uh, also, my opinion. Uh, also a friend of my favorite place in the universe, ArcaneComics.com, or Arcane Excellent. Comics and more. Brisson is a friend of the show. <laughs> also, it should be known that I've never, I never read Old Man Logan. I watched, I read uh, the first volume of Old Man Hawkeye. So uh, this is brand new to me for Old Man, or now Dead Man Logan. And I enjoyed it. Like, I, I don't think you're be, going to be lost if you're just picking it up at Old Man Logan at all. Dude, go read Old Man Logan. Just, just hang up the call right now and go read it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like, Old Man Logan has, um, to me, been... <laughs> Hi, Brian. Uh, Old Man Logan, to me, has been a really intriguing character. Uh, obviously, I'm a big Mike Miller, uh, Mark Miller fan. So, you know, I was reading Wolverine at the time when he was on the Marvel Knights line. And then out of that, when Wolverine was killed by that hack who shall not be named, um, they brought in... Is that Soul? Old... Is that Soul? That? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, they brought in Old Man Logan as you know, almost like, I mean, it was almost a cop out, right? Like you look at it and you're like, all right, well, we got Wolverine's dead. Here's Wolverine, right? You know, the king is dead. Long live the king. But <laughs> on the flip side, what you get is a more introspective version of a character that we've known for decades, like a character that has this kind of greater understanding of who the character is. Like with Wolverine, there's always that kind of distance between the past and the present. And with Old Man Logan, that, that distance seems really, like completely erased. And I think that's what makes him a, a, such a compelling character and maybe a more compelling character than Wolverine. Like this is Wolverine at maximum potential for characterization, if not ability. So Brisson has done just a great job. And before him, Jeff Lemire, and before him, Mark Miller. Uh, I think there's a five-issue miniseries in between there. I don't know who wrote that, and I haven't read it. But for the most part, I think I've read just about everything Old Man Logan has shown up in, and I've really grown to love the character. So seeing this kind of swan song starting, you know, this final chapter, I think it's a really great did you, progressive. Did you read arc. Old Man Logan Deadpool? I did not read Old Man Logan Deadpool, although I have Old Man Logan Deadpool. It was so it was know. surprisingly great. <laughs> I will read it eventually. Um, you the know Deadpool, my thoughts on Deadpool. But. The clear Deadpool hate is is palpable. It's amazing. Um, I actually reviewed it for the site. I think I reviewed two through five. <laughs> um, way back after I started. Um, I really liked the book. Were you done talking? I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm just rambling about a book I love. I, I kind of get on these rants. <laughs> um, I really liked it. Um, I, I, I literally just read it. Truthfully, I forgot that it was going to be our spotlight book until about 40 minutes ago. So I, um, I, I speed read it. And um, I got to say, um, I felt like his characterization of voice for Hawkeye was perfect probably the best i've read for hawk guy since the fraction fraction run um he did a really good job of nailing what fraction did which was uh make hawkeye feel like an unknown character <laughs> like he's the he's the fall guy of the avengers <laughs> like, and they had the moment where he's standing at the counter in the mental institution trying to get in like i'm an avenger and the lady's like you're not an avenger i know the avengers thor captain america iron man he's like there's more than that many avengers and he's like and then she names stingray and he's like you know stingray and you don't know me like <laughs> that was a very fraction run that, that was hilarious it was, was and very... by the way we were listening while well, me and cody were taking our notes we would listen to JJ literally laugh as he was reading. 
it was hilarious. And it made me bring back like all the, when I was reading it, all the things that I laughed about. Um, one thing I really, really liked is when Mysterio was in the mental institution and he's talking to Miss Sinister. They had nods to him dying in Daredevil, him getting beat up by Spider-Man, him dying in Daredevil all the way back in 1997, him, di- him, him getting beat up by Spider-Man as far back as the 60s, and him getting run over by a dune buggy by Deadpool in like 2012. Which was legitimately hilarious. Um, and these are all really good. Um, Brisson has always or has often shown a good mind for uh, continuity, which is, I feel like, pretty sorely lacking in a lot of books in Marvel right now. Where, you know, like for instance, you'll have Thor with a cracked skull in Immortal Hulk and Thor hitting on She Hulk in Avengers, and at the same time, Thor finding a girlfriend in Hulk or in Thor <laughs> three different versions of Thor in three different titles. But I mean, um, it's Hulk. I mean, it's Thor. I mean, yeah, it's but possible. Thor is amazing. Thor is amazing. Yeah. He does drink and get around. That's true. But, um, one thing that I feel like is kind of sorely lacking in, uh, Marvel comics right now in particular, not, not trying to single them out necessarily, but they are certainly the worst defender is, the fact that um, a lot of titles kind of disregard what's happening in other titles in favor of their own narratives, which uh, other, other um, publishers are better about. But um, I will say that, um, so it was really cool seeing some nods to previous continuity and some nods to ongoing continuity. I also absolutely love when a series picks up exactly where a previous series left off. So I love that this series seemingly picked up moments after the end of Old Man Logan. That's a well, it that's really a, did. It really did. That's like a great exactly. touch. Yeah. That's and a, I mean, it helps. You said that Brisbane was writing it too. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, that helps. But, I mean, to, to that point, like, we had a long discussion last week about, uh, you know, respecting what came before you and writers, you know, writers who not, shall not be named be being guilty of not paying attention to what came before them. Are and, you talking about Bendis or Brubaker? <laughs> <laughs> I bet it's Bendis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so... So I mean, like uh, that's I mean that's something that is somewhat of a lost art amongst all companies right now, and to see Brisson take it on and do what he does, uh, it's really something to take note of. Like it's something worth mentioning, it's something worth paying attention to, and we see it right now with Uncanny too. Like the ways that they're picking up the themes of X Men over the last fifty years. Like you've got that striking scene of Bishop with a protester on the ground, a anti-mutant protester. He's just saved from a dinosaur attack because there's dinosaurs attacking in uncanny X-Men. Go buy that book. In Montana. Uh, in Montana. <laughs> yeah. Like this is, I mean, shit is happening. Go read who fu- that. In, in, in fairness though, who fucking pickets in Montana? There's a million people in the entire state. <laughs> who are you going to, who are you going to reach? Who doesn't think like you in Montana? regardless regard let, <laughs> let's say they came over from chicago i don't know but anyway like he's got this he's got this downed anti-mutant protester that he just saved the life of picks him up and hands him back his sign like if there is any moment in the last 20 years that has screamed the essence of x-men more than that please tell me because i didn't see it and i've been reading them for the last 20 years he took he took the damn high ground, and that was amazing. Yeah, like, and he that, showed, so as you little, said earlier, as you yeah. sorry sorry Brian, as you said earlier, he didn't let the hate overwhelm him to the point of violence. I, I know you said that earlier, and mm-hmm. I just wanted I know you, you might not. Have, it was it was perfect the way he said it. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that caught, caused a little bit of drama today. There was some tea on that. <laughs> um, and I liked it. <laughs> there was a lot of hate going back and forth, and I was like, "Yes, this is lot great." Of, lot not of not because of huh? A lot of shade being thrown as the kids yeah. Said. No, that was it was <laughs> it wasn't cloudy, but there was some shade. <laughs> um, no, okay. So what I'm talking about is we all belong to different Facebook groups, and one of the bigger Facebook groups 
um, some person put something that he was annoyed by the scene, which is fine. I mean, I didn't, I don't, even to this point, I still don't understand why that was an issue with the scene or with the cover, but the, just the comments alone on what that caused, that, yeah, it was, it was, it was a cloudy day, guys. Definitely cloudy. <laughs> I mean, it well, was he, a perfect. He was saying that he felt like Bishop should have punched the guy, and I think the point is that Bishop didn't punch the guy. Like, right. The, yeah. The, like the, yeah. the point is that he chose to take the moral high ground, and not at all that he should have beaten the guy's ass, which arguably you can do. But I live in Seattle, where protest is rampant on both sides of the both sides of the aisle, and um, you know, if you go around punching protesters, you're just as bad as they are. You know, <laughs> right? Well, I mean, and the the argument for punching him is, you know, like giving him a sign back and saving his life isn't going to stop him from being a racist. And yeah, that's probably true, but that's not the point. The point is, Bishop, future cop, XSE, to serve and protect character, is not here to carry out personal vendettas. Like, that's never been in his character. His character has always been what is good for the greater good. And at that moment, they're not fighting the protesters. They're fighting the goddamn dinosaurs, which is awesome, right? So, I mean, they're, and why are they fighting the dinosaurs? So the dinosaurs don't eat the protesters. Why would you kill the protester that you just saved? That doesn't make any sense. Like, come on, people. Heads, asses, out. Like, this is, this is not rocket science here. This is about a team of mutants gathered together to protect <laughs> a world that hates and fears them. This is, I mean, and this is what it has been since 1963. So. And I know we're talking old man Logan and not uncanny X-Men, but uh, I also did love that the protesters were throwing rocks at Legion. <laughs> it was like, all right, yeah, you better come inside. <laughs> It's like <laughs> I totally forgot how I got to that. Oh no, I, right. So I mean, it's that that notion of the spirit of the character, and I feel like Brisson is just tops of the field right now in getting the spirit of these characters. So kudos to Ed Brisson. And uh, on that, if anybody, if nobody else has anything else to say on I that did topic, have one. I had one question about old man Logan. If anybody knows if and when Sin got her face back, uh, last I saw of Sin was at the end of Brubaker's run when she had her face burned off and she had become the new Red Skull. This was like 10 years ago, so it's 100% possible at some series, at some point along the way, she got her face back or she got a mask. But uh, if somebody could tell me when that happened, I would love to read that series. Um, I'm you know, six or seven years behind on cap besides the current series. <laughs> so, and I'm, I mean, I feel can't, like... can't we just say that it happened during secret wars and be done with it? Like secret wars fucked with so much continuity that it doesn't seem that's fair. Like, like anything survived intact. So I don't know. I, I would take the secret wars cop out on that. I didn't mind. I thought that, uh, I thought her face looked weird. Like it Mike didn't Anderson's... bother me. It... It could have been a mask. It, it could, could have, been a, well have been a mask. Yeah. Like there was something kind of lumpy about her face. I don't know if that's Mike Henderson's style. Like I'm not super familiar with him. I, I did. I kind of felt the same way as B. Like this wasn't my favorite art. But I didn't hate it. Like it was still pretty solid art. And it still was, you know, detailed enough and pushed the narrative forward in a couple of ways. Like there were a couple of panels that were clearly the action was happening through the art, not through the text. So I mean, I can appreciate it, but her face looked weird at the end. So maybe it's a mask. It's a little funny because um, I, I reviewed Old Man Logan for this, or Deadpool Old Man Logan for the site like a year ago, just because I was available or I was writing a lot at the time, and uh, I picked it up for the site, um, not because I had any affection for the characters. But this is the Old Man Logan art I'm familiar with, <laughs> and so this felt great to me. <laughs> But it might just be because this is the art I know. <laughs> right, no, that totally makes sense. Like, I went from Sorrentino, well, I mean, McNiven first, right? And then Sorrentino on the 
beginning of this series to Mike Deodato, and then you know they kind of bounced around a lot. But but yeah, yeah no, damn, that's that's a that's a bit of a step down, I gotta say, from Dio, <laughs> from Sorrentino, then Deodato, and then Anderson. <laughs> but this is the old man Logan that I'm familiar with. I really need to catch up. I think I probably need to read that 50 issues before the next monthly comes out. Yeah, you really should. It's definitely worth it. I highly recommend it to anybody that's uh, looking for a reading project to get into. Old Man I Logan. always am. 50 issues through. Uh, I think maybe there were two is- two or three issues where I was like, eh. I mean, like towards the very end, he had an arc with Alpha Flight. And I appreciate that they brought in Alpha Flight as kind of a, you know, this is a farewell from dead- from Old Man Logan to Alpha Flight. But the arc itself, like the actual story behind it, was not the greatest. But other than that, like this book, this book was fire for forty-seven out of fifty issues. So I mean, go check it out uh, if you want to check out some of our reviews. I reviewed number fifty and Dead Man Logan number one. I didn't realize we weren't reviewing it, and then all of a sudden it was like, oh well, shoot. All right, I will. I will, I will review this. I got it. So, so JJ, do you want to put a break on X Men, Uncanny X Men, so we can read Dead Man Logan or Old Man Logan? Oh, do you want to? We can, because I'm kind of interested in catching up on that too. What issue are you on on Uncanny? Uh, one twenty-eight. Uh, August twenty-nine, maybe. August here seven ish. You're at the start of the Hellfire Club. Yeah, yeah. Emma just made okay. her first appearance. Okay, you're set. You're like seven issues behind me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we can do that. I'll probably I'll probably blow through it real quick. I know. Oh, I'm not saying that. I got Conan to read. I got Silver Age Green Lantern to read. I got so much shit to. Re- you have no. You think your to read piles big? I got like seventy years of continuity. I got to. Bro- <laughs> no, Grant I Morrison's it- referencing Silver Age Green Lanterns. I guess I got to read forty years of Green Lantern before I can write this next review. <laughs> <laughs> no, Good luck it's with not that. that I have a lot to read. It's just time. Although, like, I don't know if you guys can see, but this little box right here that my finger's over is all the things that I have to read. Um, That's not so bad. I got no. piles. I got. I started distributing the. It sucks because I got these short boxes lined up now, and now I got yeah. piles on the short boxes and on my bookshelves. Now I'm up to six piles. <laughs> we read so I- much. I got Godzilla, I got Conan, I got Green Lantern, <laughs> I got some Superman, I got I got action like, comics like, that I've ever read. Yeah, I'm on Hal Jordan Green Lanterns Volume Two, I think, is what's next in the pile. Oh, oh nice. that's so that's good. good. Is that yeah. is that Larflees? Is that when they join up with the Yellow Lantern Corps and fight Larflees and Brainiac? I haven't opened it yet. I think yeah, that's it's right. probably the one. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds familiar. It reminds me of how the arc ended in the first one. Volume three of that should be amazing because that's when Guy Gardner fights Arkillo hand to hand. He takes the ring off and great. says, "Let's yeah. do this," and it's the best. It's like a two issue fight. Well, one of ever. one of the great all time one on one fights in history, like the, up there with Superman Doomsday. That was that was a fantastic fight. Be hard on it. The yeah. fight. It's just <laughs> okay. All right, so. Moving on, from, that. <laughs> moving on from Dead Man Logan and various tangents. Um, we're missing Derbs to keep us on track to pop up in the chat and say, go do something else. Shut up. So without Derbs, that means that falls to me, which is a problem. <laughs> so, so moving on, I think Brian's got some more uh, personal taste, subjective questions for us. Yeah, and normally I usually think about it for a couple of days, and I did think of one like a week ago, but what had happened was I forgot to write it down, and I have no idea, so I was like skimming for it. So I have three simple questions. Um, JJ, you may have trouble with one of them. The other three, I don't, I think, or the other two, I think you guys will blow by fine. Um, the first question is: Was Cyclops right? Yes. Okay. Okay. I don't even know what you're talking about, but I like Cyclops to a degree, and um, I wouldn't say I like him better than the other X-Men, but he has a certain type of logic about him a lot of the time, and I'm just going to go with a gut reaction here and say yes. That's that's solid. Um, I'm going to say he wasn't wrong. 
uh, like his his theoretical premise, right? His ideologue was made. It made sense, right? Do whatever it takes to survive, and I mean, and that's ingrained in most life forms instinctually. But his execution of said premise was not right. Like his execution of said premise, given you know that this is somebody who has been raised essentially by Professor Xavier and in Professor Xavier's dream of harmony between mutants and humans. And I mean, like this is believer number one, like the, the most powerful person in any movement isn't the leader, it's the first follower. Right. So he is the first follower, really. I mean, you know, you can make arguments for Sage or whoever else, you know, has been extra canonically added in over the years. But I mean, Scott is follower number one. And to see him switch to an extremist, uh, borderline terrorist stance feels incredibly out of character, for one thing. I mean, this is Mr. Vanilla. And two, it just it feels like it's the wrong direction for any of you know, the disciples of Xavier. So he wasn't wrong. Like that cloud had to go. That yeah. cloud was a friggin' problem. But you know, he he died from it. You know, and Jamie died from it, but didn't die from it. Whatever. But yeah, no, like that's that's a he'll, tough he'll question. He'll be back. <laughs> that's a tough question. And he will be back in Apparently uh, you know, in on, January. In January. So uh, I look forward to seeing how they execute that and what Scott we get back, whether this is, you know, that era of X-Men that I wasn't really down with or, you know, some other era of X-Men where I didn't really care about Scott, but at least he was Scott. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll give so it we'll to see. them. They did a good job keeping him dead and uh, Logan dead. Original Logan, whatever and you Gene. want to call him. And Gene. And Gene. I mean, Gene was dead for a long-ass time. I think over uh, 10 it, years. Yeah. That's probably the longest Marvel's ever kept anyone dead. Besides, I mean, Mor- maybe, maybe what? I was gonna say, like Morrison killed Gene. Yeah, uh, I mean, I was. Oh boy, so dating myself. I was at DLI in two thousand and two when I started reading Morrison. Two thousand one when I started reading Morrison. So, I mean, like that was you know probably closer to fifteen years that Gene was dead. That's that's like twenty five years in the future from where I'm reading. So, yeah, me too. I guess right now, um, I agree with you guys. I think that he was right to an extent. The reason that question came up is because it kind of reminded me of, well, if it was Cyclops instead of Bishop with the protesters, would that have changed after, after uh, he kind of did a leap? So that's kind of where that question came from. And I was like, probably he. I don't feel like Cyclops even in his worst set of mindset would mow down a bunch of protesters, but who knows where his mind was at that time. Um, the second question, you guys are going to probably jump for joy or hang me. Um, who is your all, only one? Because Cody, I know you like to go around things and be able to snaggle out. So who is your all time favorite Batman writer? You're on mute, JJ. <laughs> I know. I, I breathed in, in terror for a minute. Um, <laughs> it's between Chuck Dixon and Morrison uh, for me. Um, I'd probably go Chuck Dixon. I bet Cody's going to go Moench. Now he's not because you said that. <laughs> he's thinking of a different way of going. That's just, I mean... Like, that's maybe the meanest question you could ever ask me. Um, oh, shit. Um, I mean, Starlin wrote Death in the Family, which was one of my first uh, Batman arcs that I read, you know, as it was coming out. Dixon was so instrumental. Uh, I didn't love 
Grant Morrison's. I, I love Grant Morrison, but I didn't love his Batman. Uh, I mean, there's always, there's Frank Miller. There's, oh my God. Um, so do you want me, what you think, do you want me to go with mine? Yeah, please, please do. Uh, mine's really easy, as I've expressed before. It's probably going to be Tom King. <laughs> um, it is. I, I mean, per- huh? I quit this show. No, you can't. We, you have failed this city. <laughs> no, I mean, because until I get more experience, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna say Tom King because he is my favorite right now. Uh, go to, go will, to Santa Prisca. Yeah, rise, but I will say rise, that he's rise, only my favorite rise. writer. <laughs> writer on Batman. He's done other books that I'm not a fan of. So for right now, I'll just say with he's my favorite Batman. Okay. So, and this is going to sound wrong, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. Because of the powerful impact of Black Mirror on what I think was a turning point in comics narrative, and then his move into New 52, I'm gonna say Scott Snyder. I'm gonna say that- I was that, not expect- I'm gonna say that, oh, we lost JJ. Um, I blew his mind. But yeah, like there were things that Snyder did. Snyder has a respect for what came before with an eye towards the future. Um, and I, I, I know that, you know, Right, you came in in the middle of the uh, Gordon in Mech Armor arc, which was just the worst possible time you could come into Snyder's work. I um, really liked Super Heavy. I it was fine. It was it was not a bad arc, but if you're looking at like definitive Batman arcs, sorry, my you know, my phone hung up automatically. By the way, <laughs> that wasn't on purpose, but it was perfectly timed. It was perfectly <laughs> timed. Like I just destroyed, <laughs> I devastated JJ with that answer. And I mean, like, and then you've, you've kind of heard me work through the process. Um, and it's, and that's such a difficult question, but I think Snyder has done more for the character in the spirit of the character while also kind of pushing him to new heights more than a lot of other writers have in the past. Um, but I mean, like, and as much as, you know, I, I, you will hear occasionally, I will bash Jim Starlin. Like, Jim Starlin did some great things. Um, Ed Brubaker and Greg Rucka, like, their time on Batman was absolutely fantastic. But I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to final answer. I'm going to say Snyder for now. Um, I will say, and it, it, I liter- this literally just occurred to me, the current Nightwing arc is totally ripping off super heavy. I just yeah. realized it just now. Yeah. Just since we since I said those words, I realized the current Snyder or the current Nightwing arc is ripping off super heavy. Yeah, it's I can got, see that. I it's can see got that, but Batman with no memory, a new Batman taking over with updated tech but less less knowledge. Mm-hmm. It's got it's super heavy. Oh yeah, my no, god. I can, I can totally see that, but also remember that uh, Scott Lobdell had his hands in Batman continuity when that was happening. So it's not really, can you plagiarize yourself? Uh, you know, like, you know, from an academic standpoint, yes, of course you can. But, you know, I feel like this is kind of taking something. You can, you can you, rehash old work for sure. Right. Like, yeah, I mean. Chris Claremont has proven that time James, and time James again. James Robinson just did that for like six issues. <laughs> right. right. So, yeah, I mean, what a great question, B. I mean, yes, what a terrible question. Like, you're so mean. But also, great question. Yeah, I try to get like one hard one and then like two kind of throwaway ones. Um, the final question is really simple and it's clearly a throwaway. It's just to see who do you prefer better, Daredevil or Punisher? Oh, I think that's Daredevil, no question. Um, although I, I like Punisher's more fu- final, uh, more final terms of justice. I think as a character, Daredevil has a lot more potential. As uh, seems like Punisher 
builds up a new villain and then kills him and then builds up a new villain and then kills him and then builds up a new from a from a reading standpoint daredevil's a much better character but uh from a practical standpoint punisher is a much better character <laughs> that's a that's a great answer um and i don't i don't disagree it for me it depends on who's writing the character so um hi 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 Artemis is awake, uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and say, uh, Punisher if Garth Daddy. Ennis is writing him, and Daredevil in all other circumstances. Daddy. Um, for me, I'm gonna have to say that it's. God, I was really unprepared for this one. I was expecting to have you guys, and then I was gonna come up with my own decision. <laughs> um, that's a fail. Um, I'm going to go with Punisher just because he's the only one that I'm reading. I haven't necessarily read Daredevil. Um, so I, I don't, I only read Punisher one through four. So we decided for a second spotlight book this week, we decided to spotlight action comics number 1005, 1005 issues of action comics. Show me something else that has 80 plus years of continuity in the United States on a monthly basis like that is just astounding so action comics 1005 it's written by brian michael bendis artist is ryan suck colorist brad anderson and letterer josh josh reed uh this issue is the first issue of action comics that to me since bendis took over was not in action comics like this was the first issue where there were some fight sequences. There was some actual action happening. Uh, for those of you that are not following along with Bendis's takeover of the Superman group of books, for the most part, action has been focused on Clark Kent and Superman has been focused on well, Superman. Uh, and while to some degree that makes sense, Action has been very devoid of any actual action. Action. I, I, I hate to just keep sounding like I'm repeating myself, but I mean, this is kind of an interesting point. Like, if these titles were flipped, it would make more sense. So, the main, the main antagonist in uh, action right now has been, well, really a mob boss going by the name of Mr. Strong who has gathered a group of minor crime bosses, you know, turf divided, that operate specifically when Superman is either distracted or out of town. They're unknown. Nobody knows about these guys. They meet in, like, this lead pipe. You know, all conversations omit Superman, Lois Lane, Kryptonite, like all the major keywords that Superman listens for. And they're out there taking advantage of what they can when they can. So they've got a tech guy that tracks him via satellite, says, you know, up, oh, dude's out of the galaxy. Go on, go knock over the bank. They also have recently added a meta named Red Cloud. And this is the issue where we get the startling reveal of who red cloud is and i mean i i don't know about you guys but we have uh what's her name i don't remember the name of the new reporter at the daily planet that's taken over lois's desk no, there's but two I don't like her. there's there's trish and then there's robinson good robinson good yeah, Ro yeah robinson yeah robinson good is the one i'm thinking of right like she's taking over lois's spot like trish is just taking over cat's spot who cares uh, gossip. Column. I really, I wanted, I wanted it to be Trish. I was mad when it was Robinson. I wanted it. To, that would have made. That would have been a genuinely surprising reveal. This it would have been the reveal it that it was Robinson. Kind of pissed me off because it but, would have been great if it wasn't her. I, I, I don't disagree like that, and that's kind of my point is that you bring in Good, who is a central character, filling the Lois Lane void. And at the same time, you bring in the Red Cloud, who is a new villain. New villain, new support character, who is more or less a central primary character. 
you also bring in Foxy Firefighter Lady, and you and you, you tease and also- and you tease in DC Nation number zero. One of these four women is Red Cloud, and you have Trish Robinson Good, Firefighter Lady, and Lois Lane. We know it's not Lois Lane. It's probably not Firefighter Lady. It was either Trish or Red or Robinson Good, right. and he picked the more likely of the two, which is lame to me. Yeah, I and I agree. Um, but the issue is not a bad issue in general. Like you get that, you know, you get that big reveal. Like, oh no, Robinson Good is Red Cloud, and she was under Superman's nose the whole time. And you know, you've got that sequence in the issue before or the or one hundred and three, where she's in a villain bar trying to buy some kryptonite, and. You know, things have gone wrong. Batman has stolen the kryptonite, which is awesome. Like, she got mugged by Batman. Dope. All right. Kudos, Bendis. Um, And the Red Cloud attacks the person that sold it to her because, obviously, they must be a snitch. Except for Red Cloud is the person that's accusing her of being a snitch. So, I mean, like, there's, there's something weird about the operation of how Red Cloud's powers work that I kind of feel like with a fair amount of experience with Brian Michael Bendis's writing is something he didn't really think through. Like, can she maintain a physical form and a cloud form at the same time? Clearly she can, except this is the only instance where we see that. So problems arise. Um, and where there are problems, there are questions. And the question showed up in Action Comics 1005. And that is never a bad thing for fans because the question is one of the great all-time characters in the DC universe, thanks to his introduction from the Charlton universe. So, I mean, like, this issue had some ups and downs, but overall, I would say of the... Yeah five issues of Bendis' run on action, this was by far the strongest one. Uh, We see some hints at the hero dial, the dial H for hero dial. Uh, This one appears to be a counterfeit, but I think this is the first time we've seen a hero dial in Rebirth. Yeah, um, the thing is, Bendis has a dial H for hero series coming up. It's not, it's not a, uh, it's not a clever reference. It's a plug for his new series. Likewise, he recently said he has an upcoming secret series coming with Ryan Sook. One issue later, question shows up. So Dollars to Donuts is either Dollars to Donuts is either going to be a question or a Guardian series because he had a Guardian cameo in one thousand three. He's not Something like for, he's not for me. having. He's not having clever references. He's plugging future books. Maybe, but I mean, if that's the case, you know, this this is creating a kind of more extended continuity. Like, growing up, what I did, Guardian being in a Superman book was not a cameo. Like, this was a regular occurrence. So, I mean, I, I can appreciate this kind of nod to the 90s where... You know, Guardian was just a part of the extended family. Like, when Clark died, that was one of the things that we expected. And there was that one shot. Um, it was Guardian and Rose and Thorn and Gangbuster and a handful of other, like, kind of street-level Metropolis vigilantes that all kind of came together and, you know, had their own little one-shots about you know, what they were doing post the death of Superman. I wish I could remember the name of that. I'll dig it up. But anyway. So I mean like are, there to are you me, talking about Ray, of, Reign of the Superman? No, it was it was um it was at the same time. Yeah. But it was it was a one shot like maybe a month into that. Um I can see the cover too. I just can't see the title. But anyway, um Next week, I will tell you what that was. But, like, to me, there's something about the way that Bendis is approaching this that reminds me a lot of the 90s when we had five monthly Superman titles. You know? Like, 
so and all of them had their own kind of recurring guest stars so now here you're getting some of those same recurring guest stars plus the question dial h for hero you know guardians back guardian should have never left like I always thought he was a really great counterbalance in any super Superman narrative. Um, so, I mean, like, I'm not mad at him for that. I'm not mad at him for looking to expand. Most of what I'm mad about is just the kind of predictability and uh, the repetitive tropes. Like Lois's post-it notes. They're cool. They're fun. They're exciting. Like, where is Checkmate? I'm looking forward to seeing when Checkmate shows up. But like we've seen this time and time again. We saw this with Rip Hunter's board. Uh, we've seen this in numerous other places over the years. Uh, so it's not, you know, it's not clever. It's not new. It's not special. It's I love just... picking apart Rip Hunter's board back in the day. Oh, I loved yeah. it. Yeah, it was so <laughs> much fun. It was so much fun. Every every issue, like, wait a minute. what What could that be? So, I mean, like, it's not a bad run, and I think I mentioned it to you guys earlier. I've been going on way longer than I intended on. I, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but it's the kind of arc that I would expect from so-and-so comic book writer that I didn't know about before they started on this run. Not Brian Michael Bendis, superstar comic book writer, who has been plugged and hyped for months prior to taking over this book. Like this feels like just kind of a general run of the mill, you know, six issues and done. I'm gonna push it to trade. You sound like mags. <laughs> <laughs> well, when he's right, he's right. Uh, as much as I am loath to admit that when he's right, he's right. Like this, this is a problem. This is, this is typical writing to the trade kind of forgettable dreck. And I expected more from Bendis's first time writing Superman than I'm getting. But it's good. It's not bad. It's not like I'm going to drop this book because it's fine. It's fine. It's just not what I expected. Yeah, for all the hype that went into it, it did seem like it should be a bigger book. Um, I know that you guys commented on the sticky notes. I absolutely love the sticky notes, but also because I don't have previous history of other people doing it. Um, I like reading, I guess because I have a ton of sticky notes at my desk every day. So it kind of like it humorizes or humanizes it a little bit for me because I'm like, oh yeah, I've definitely had that one on my, on my computer screen before or whatnot. Um, as far as the book itself, it did see because it's now monthly before it was bi weekly and it seemed to be a little bit more action packed. So I think it's kind of weird the way that it's coming out right now and it makes it slower because I always have to think of what, what, what happened in the last action. Um, Superman itself, it feels like those books should be switched. Like action should be in Superman because Superman's where all the action is and Superman, generally speaking, is usually where it's more of a form of. Clark and Superman versus this one is definitely more of a Clark thing. Um, I'm almost speculating that since there's a weird relationship between Lois Lane and Superman right now, or Clark, they're not necessarily estranged, but they're kind of not living together type thing. And then there's the hottie fire woman. Is there going to be love? Is there going to be something there? As I titled my review, where I come from, we call that a trial separation. <laughs> right, right. It's a definitely. It seems that way. Um, and I remember, like, when that issue came out, there's so much controversy about it, saying that it's not feminism, and then some people are saying it is, and just why can't she have both? And it's like, well, it's because people break up or separate or whatever. Not saying that it's happening, but it was just. It's really weird how comic books take effect on people's lives and have so opinionated opinions and ways to push their agendas depending on like a single issue of, yeah, I don't want to live with you, but right now we're good fucking. Like, that's, that's fine, you know, you do you, boo, you do you. Um, so yeah, I enjoyed it. Um, and again, I, I like it. It's, 
I really liked Superman when Rebirth came about. Um, and it did seem kind of trail off. I like Brian Michael Bendis. I mean, we've talked about him many times on the show before. I don't think that Superman is his best run to date. Uh, I, I think he does perfect where he is able to just create his own universe where he's kind of not, where he's able to do whatever he wants because it's his home creation where he's not like seatbelted in by other people or other writers' past experiences and trying to stay true to them. So I definitely think that his own is stuff like Pearl or Cover and stuff like that. Um, but it's not a bad book. I'm going to continue reading it. I like the sticky notes. Please don't stop the sticky notes. It makes me happy. Well, yeah. And I mean, like Ryan Sook's art is fire. Like it's so good. Um, and Bendis is who Bendis is. Like he's not a writer who's unaware of what came before him. And he's not one that's going to completely discard anything that came before him. But at the same time, he's not necessarily the right voice for a lot of the bigger, more mainstream characters. You know, he had his run with, you know, the Avengers that was really solid, like really, really solid work. And then when he moved on to New Avengers, like I was totally in, in for a penny, in for a pound. Um, but there came a point where his voice from his, you know, independent works like Powers and some of his, you know, more indie mainstream work like Daredevil and things like that um, showed how he's better suited to certain projects than others. And I mean, there's, there's no fault in that. Like, I'm not mad at Brian Michael Bendis for not having the right voice for X-Men, let's say. But... Or, you know, obviously, like, we're talking about Superman. Like, he doesn't quite seem to have the right voice for Superman. Um, but I'm, I'm going to ride with it. Like, I, I haven't not bought action since 1989. So, I mean, I'm going to keep doing it. Like, I've, I've, suffered, through, I've <laughs> suffered through much worse. Um, it's just not what it's just not where I expected it to be. Like I expected the stakes to be high. And the stakes aren't high. Like the only high stakes are in Lois and Clark's relationship. And how can that be high stakes? Like it, Well, in Superman, I mean in the Superman series it's pretty high stakes and in the Phantom Zone. No, yeah, but I mean it, not it, anymore. But but Lois and Clark shouldn't be high stakes. Reed right. and Sue shouldn't be high stakes. Yeah, you know, like they're Peter and Gwen, uh, MJ. Yeah, I almost said Gwen. Um, Peter and MJ shouldn't be high stakes. Like there are certain relationships in comics that are what they are because they work, because they make sense. You know, you you can take the argument on Cyclops and Jean or Cyclops and Emma all day long, and you know whatever it is, what it is. Uh, I don't feel like that's one of those types of relationships. But Lois and Clark, that is like the model relationship. And if you start mucking with that. She treated him like crap for 40 years. I don't, I don't, uh, I mean, you're the expert, but. Um, <laughs> she was so mean to him for so long. <laughs> She treated him like shit for decades. But, but she treated <laughs> the she treated the two of them as separate entities like that. I want more. Mm -hmm. um, she treated the two of them like separate entities like that. Like once she was aware of what was going on, it wasn't she didn't treat him like crap. Like she accepted I, both I, sides. Well, that was in like Nobody, you didn't treat me like crap. I love you. Go back to the bedroom, please. Um, that was like 1982, though. He had already existed for like 44 years at that point when she finally found out he was Superman. And she didn't treat him good until she found out he was Superman. She's like well, the worst kind of gold digger. Like, she's a superhero gold digger. She found out that he was worth a shit, and then she turned her act around. She turned her, her, her bitchy ways around. It wasn't because she found out or because she decided to turn her busy ways around and then he decided to reveal his identity to her. 
It was the other way around. Cody, you can't hear me anymore. I thought the issue was fine. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I didn't think it was great. I didn't think it was terrible. Um, it was probably the best issue of action yet that Bendis has written, but I haven't liked the previous four issues of action for a long stint there. I was reviewing it, and I was giving Bendis three out of ten on average on, for writing on every issue. There was one issue where we, we only saw Superman for two pages in the entire issue. That was 1002, whatever yeah. the one with Batman was. Um, this issue was better. Um, I liked that we got a little bit of furthering of the story. Um, it still bothers me that Superman's in the lead, or they're hiding for Superman in the lead too, because in the Burn Man of Steel mini from the 80s, he, um, Joker hides Lois Lane in a lead coffin and she's going to hang out, hide, or she's going to run out of air. Mm-hmm. And in the lead coffin, he says, I just looked through the entire city and found the thing that I couldn't see through. <laughs> Like a lead cough or a lead giant lead tube is insanely visible to Superman because it's it's a big fourteen hundred pound thing you can't see through. Um, it's it's a little silly. Um, yeah, but I mean, like this is you know post uh, fall of Metropolis. Metropolis, like there's a lot of that stuff that Luther has put all over the city. Like he's not checking all of those things. Yeah, lead pipes I'm not, and stuff. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not super upset about that. And go, going back, like I, I, I obviously, I missed a few minutes here. But uh, going back to Lois, like she is the pinnacle of the feminist movement. And I see what Bendis is attempting to do is push that into kind of the more of the late twenty or you know early twenty first century notion of what the feminist movement looks like and i appreciate that uh so i'll be like the 40 years of treating him like crap is you know subjective if you look at the cultural relativity of the moments where you're calling that you know this was a whole different world where she was incredibly progressive and you know putting her career first and putting it before all men and not looking for a knight in shining armor to save her, and I really, I really do appreciate that about Lois over the years. Um, was it always handled with the most deft writing hand? No, of course not. It was mostly men writing a progressive feminist character. Like that's never going to be quite as good as if we had a woman writer or feminist writer trying to push that narrative. And, you know, I I do feel like with the way that he's treating their relationship, he is pushing forward a narrative that needs to be pushed forward. I just don't know that he's handling it in the best way he can. And I've seen him handle things better than he is at the moment. I, I I can respect that. I mean, to me, now that JJ's pointed her out as a super gold digger, I'm over her. Let's get them divorced. Let's hook them up with a hottie firefighter. We're good. End of story. No, I'm just kidding. Like, I don't actually... Um, I mean, there's. I've never really been a fan of Superman or Lois Lane up until recently. So, I mean, I have a lot to catch up on before I can even step foot into this argument. Well, in, in fairness, I did. Uh, last year when 1000 was coming up, I read the first 560 issues of action leading up to the crisis. So, so I've read like an absurd amount of action comics. <laughs> I can't, uh, uh, it's, it's hard to convey how many comics I read for a while there. I was trying to hit a thousand. I had like uh, six weeks and I was trying to hit a th- action 1000 by the time 1000 hit. Um, and for a while there, I was reading 25, 30 issues a day. Um. <laughs> right. Like, I've, I've read a fair amount, not, uh, not that many consecutive of that side of it, but I've read a majority of what comes after what you read. Mm-hmm. So between the two of us, like, I think we have a pretty solid picture of who Lois Lane is. Um, you know, like, I've, I've probably read a quarter of 
the ones that you read, you know, via archives or chronicles as far as those first 500. Oh, but you got to read, you got to read the VAM uh, action 351 through 353. It was a total ripoff of Captain Marvel. It is amazing. He's, uh, he's imbued with a bunch of, of uh, Greek God powers and Roman God powers. And he's got a belt of other God powers, like, pagan deities and stuff and at one point he turns superman into stone and um oh my god it's just the best damn arc it's three issues uh 351 through 353 i own all three you can find them for like 10 bucks for the three of them oh my god they're great <laughs> also great is quaker which is 430 and 431 which is when a this. a hyper advanced chameleon from the 31st mm -hmm. century comes back in time <laughs> I love old action comics. <laughs> well, Javam is a pretty good uh, jumping on point for us moving on to Future Watch if we're done with action. Um, because this week, tomorrow, the day that you guys may or may not be watching this, the two of you, uh, Shazam number one is one of my top books of the week uh jeff johns uh eagle ham on art uh it's a remarkable exciting project coming out from dc comics publishing tomorrow uh this is a hell of a week for comics i don't know what you guys are excited for but you know we, it's gonna be we, pricey <laughs> it's gonna be pricey right like we as reviewers you know, we, we have access to a handful of publishers' advanced copies. So there are some things that we have seen in order to prepare for the publicity push. I've um, seen some shit. <laughs> some shit. And, and Shazam number one was one of them. Like, go to your shop, buy this book, support this book. This book is friggin' amazing. Uh, in addition, we've got Doomsday Clock number eight. Like the final chapter in the second act of Doomsday Clock, if you want to break it up into the theatrical, which I honestly like having read it and having read reread it recently, like I can see that he's sort of Jeff Johns is sort of setting it up like that. You know, act one is the setup, act two is the development, act three is the climax. Um and you can kind of see how Stop it, B. I see you smiling. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can kind of see how Doomsday Clock is shaping up into that kind of three-act mold. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no exaggeration. Doomsday Clock number eight made me cry on the toilet. <laughs> it's not out yet. I, I'm just... That's not a spoiler. <laughs> right. Him crying on the toilet is not a spoiler. That's just Tuesday. <laughs> it was Friday, but yeah. <laughs> what else do we have coming out this week? We oh, have... I actually have something um, coming out. So Spider Geddon is having a handbook out, which, by the way, you guys could have probably done that to begin with. Like, like first one for somebody who has no idea about Spider Geddon and the multi-spider universe and jumping into Spider Geddon. Yeah, number one, what like a handbook would have been helpful to see who's from what world. But since so much is happening, there's so many tie-ins. I think there's like a total of 16 books that you have to read to get it. Um, I'm actually not going to get it because I've been <laughs> reading every single not episode <laughs> issue that's come out. I right. like it. But Jesus, Marvel, like you've spent so much money or my money to figure out what the hell is going on. Like just put it in the omnis and be done with it. Um, Winter <laughs> Soldier is coming out. Yeah. I'm very excited about that. I think I'm reviewing it. Yeah. I'm reviewing it. Um, there's Red Hood and Batwoman's in this one. Kind of interested to see where that's going to go. Um, for some indie love, I have Blackbird coming out. Dead Rabbits was supposed to come out, but, you know, stuff happens. They get sued. and that's Hot it. stew. Hot stew. Um, Mary X-Men Holiday Special 1. Mm -hmm. I'm actually kind of looking forward to that, weirdly enough. Um, no, I, I think that's going to be great. Yeah. Uncanny, of course, number four. And then I have Star Wars 58. I feel like I just did that one. 
<laughs> you did. You did just do Star Wars 57. So, you know, be faster. I don't know. I was dying. <laughs> That's a plague. <laughs> both Brian and myself were sick in the last week. Uh, we're both still playing catch up. Uh, in addition to those books, we've got a new Venom. Uh, Martian Manhunter number one from Steve Orlando. If you're a Steve Orlando I, I didn't fan. Get to, I didn't get to do mine. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Go, go, go. Mar- Martian Manhunter and Venom number seven. <laughs> I did them in a different order, so it didn't sound like the thing you just said. Um, <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah. Um, Green Green Lantern that, number two comes fast. out. Green Lantern number two comes out, and um, I, I read it, and it's really good. So that's all I'm going to tell you, but it's really good. Um, <laughs> that's not a spoiler. It's not a spoiler at all. But uh, I like how really I, just because anytime he mentions something that he's already read, like I don't know if it's just yours, Cody, but my butt cheeks clench. <laughs> like, where is he going to go with this? No, nah, I'm like, and you know, Shazam was really is, good. The reality is we don't post until the day of release, so I'm not too, super sweating it. We're but, specifically uh, forbidden from doing so. We are specifically forbidden from doing so, and we shall never spoil anything prior to release day. Um, we're far too responsible for that. But, but I will, will tell you, get Green Lantern. Yeah, we will spoil the crap out of it on release day. Because some will, of these books are just remarkably great right now. I will I will say you want to get next week my my uh, must must read books are Green Lantern, Shazam, and Doomsday Clock. Do not miss those three books. Do not. They were so good. So am I the only one that doesn't read the future stuff? Yeah, I guess so. Like, what what are you doing with your life? You're, well, I try. Well, that week I was sick, and then I did it the week before, and I almost like started talking about a book that wasn't even out yet. So I was like, "Screw this! This is causing me too much issues." <laughs> like, I, I'm I, not trying to. I, it's like, a really great thing to be able to lord over people who don't write for the site yet that you're trying to get to write for the site that you've already read books that they're looking forward to. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I mean, I mean, there's no secret that we get we get advanced copies. Like, that's cool. I know, yeah. but I mean, you want to? Hey, hey, prospective reviewers, you want to read Image, Boom, Valiant, Lion Forge, Dark Horse, Dark Horse, DC Comics? You want to read all those books before they come out and lord it over your friends? Come right for Comic Watch. Wait, no. Lord it over your friends. Say, I, w- I read I this will, book. I will did. add that we do have a stringent screening process. Um, if you're not a very good writer, uh, it's not going to work out. Screening process. I happen to know the person that does most of the screening. <laughs> this guy right here. This um, is what the screening process looks like. Got to grease some <laughs> palms and wet my beak. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. But yes, no, we, we, we are looking for more writers. Uh, there are many opportunities here. And Doesn't hurt your yeah. chances to give John Jack twenty dollars in Messenger, Facebook Messenger. Go right now. It, do, it doesn't hurt your chances, but it doesn't help them either. It does help them. <laughs> We're also looking for press writers <laughs> desperately. There's four of us. Yeah. Also, we are, we also are, we are it will help for... you be accepted to give John Jack twenty dollars. <laughs> we we are looking <laughs> for more press score writers. We are looking for more list writers. Uh, this thing is taking off. Like, this thing is getting bigger than I ever expected it to get. Uh, So if you are interested in writing press, uh, reviews, lists, media, do hit us up. Like, email me at Cody at comic-watch.com. And I will probably send you an assignment. Probably send you something that says, you know, write me this, write me that. Uh, let me gauge where you are as a writer. But do hit us up because we are looking for more bodies. Um, right now, the team is about 28 to 30 people. 
split across multiple platforms, but we could always use more. Yeah, and it, plus it's just fun. Like, I mean, it's worth. We're, we're all we're all really good friends for the most part. It's a it's a really like you know these the three guys. I know only two of them are here today, but uh, mm-hmm. you know these three guys are some of my best friends on the internet. Um, and that's a big <laughs> that's a big internet. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with them. But I mean, if you do decide to apply and try to work for us, know that you are going to work. It's pretty much like a full. Part time to a full time job, depending on where, what side of the world you work on. Don't um, tell them that. Two no, hours a week tops. No, no. Suckers. Like I can, I can honestly say Cody probably puts in at least forty hours. I put in at least thirty two hours into this stuff. So I mean, we definitely work our ass off, but it's fun and the payoff's really good. And you end up on um, covers of big magazines and stuff. Oh yeah, these two these two bastards keep giving things ten out of tens and getting co- coded on the cover. Uh, <laughs> I give I go to the bottom. I like to I like to keep it real. Um, no, no, no! Don't say don't try to say that. I give. No, higher. I know, I know, I know. I I'm not, absolutely kept it real. Cover number one was a ten out of ten. Right. And and like, action action one thousand and three was a three out of ten. <laughs> And you're you're probably uh, that that might be a little bit low for me. I just read that today, so that might be a little bit low for me. But on you know, on it, writing it writing alone, writing alone, three out of ten. Art was higher, so I think it averaged out to like a five point five. That sounds that sounds about right. Like it was it was a middling middling book. Yeah, <laughs> Artemis. <laughs> All right, so. I think um, we're done. Yes, no, we're definitely done. There's kids screaming. It's it's like it's craziness. Okay, so please go ahead and check us out on our Facebook. The Comic Watchers are at the Comic Watchers. Go ahead and always hit subscribe. Um, please check us out at comic-watch.com. And if you are interested in writing, we are looking for writers. Contact Cody at Cody at uh, comic-watch.com. Check us out on Facebook, Comic Watch. Anything else I'm missing, it doesn't matter. Nobody gets to this point anyways. If you made it to this point in the show, we do apologize. (laughs) Much love to our fan base. Both of you have a great night. Thanks, Anthony. Bye.